You get nothing.
what we deal with, he's going to love us. And his love is going to just come and wash over whatever you're dealing with today, tomorrow, next week. He's there. Continue worshiping with us as we sing How He Loves.
Father, we thank you so very, very much for these tithes and these gifts. We thank you for the givers, Lord. We thank you that you can take these tithes and offerings and you can use them in your kingdom, Lord, to spread the good news of your gospel. Please, Lord, use it to strengthen your kingdom and help to bring others to come to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. chapter 7, verses 14 through 17. We know the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do not what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good, as it is it is no longer I myself who do it, but it's the sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but cannot carry it out. For I do not do good, I, I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. So I find this at work, this law at work, although I want to do good and evil right there with me, for in my sinner, in for in my sinner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war over the law of my mind and making me prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Paul is struggling. He's saying the same thing over and over again. What I want to do, I don't do. What I don't want to do, I do it. And then he repeats it again, and he says it again, and then again. And if you imagine, why, why is he saying it this way? And I know that God inspires him to write this, and I know there's a meaning for us, but I have to believe in who he is. And this is Paul. This is Paul who wrote most of the New Testament that we have. Who's had the encounter that he has with God. And I don't think he was just writing about what used to be in his life. I think he's writing about the struggle he has in the here and now. So I think Christy's right. I think that this is something that all of us are going to relate to in some way today. Christy already gave you a little bit of a hint. But we all kind of have our kryptonite. The thing that, that we struggle with. The thing that breaks us down. If, in case you didn't hear what Christy said directly pointed to me, I'll start giving you some hints. Chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, butter pecan, moose tracks, chocolate chip cookie dough, cappuccino crunch, tin roof sundae. Thank you for introducing me to that, Chairman Deacon, by the way. Saucer, pan dip, Dairy Queen, Chaps, Baskin Robbins, Mr. Goodies, and Monkey. Know what mine is? Ice cream. Well, I'm just going to throw out what some of the others may be that we deal with. 
some of the things that we lack when it comes to self-control, things that we struggle with when it comes to self-control. And first, I just want to throw out a statistic. I don't know exactly where this came from, but I think it's probably true. I didn't verify it, so I can't give you a resource for it, but regardless, it'll make you think. Supposedly, Americans spend $1.33 for every dollar earned. You catch that? Spend $1.33 for every dollar earned. In other words, if you brought home $100 this week for work, you went out and spent $133. What happens if you keep doing that? You're going into debt. And a lot of other stuff is going to happen too. And why does this happen? One of my favorite stores is Sam's, for whatever reason. But Sam's can be a problem. You can go in Sam's and you can find things in there you didn't know exist, much less think you need it, and you come home and you have 500 of them and know where to put it. Money you spent that you didn't have for things you didn't even know you needed. And then another place that we struggle with self-control sometimes is anger. We, we can't control our emotions enough, and so we fly off the handle, yelling things that bring about regret, often at death schools that may break the local noise on ordinance. And then there's gossip. Gossip. And gossip, it's, it's not something you can touch, but I tell you, gossip can be juicy. It's just a juicy morsel of news that may or may not be true, but we just sometimes can't help but from repeating it. It's something that's in our mind. It's something we know. And it's just possible this person beside us doesn't know it. And it just seems like it has to come out. We have to say it. We have to let it be known. Another place we struggle with self-control is addiction. The addiction can be with so many things. Tobacco products, drugs, alcohol, pornography. And it's not just that we're addicted to it, but the effects of what it does, it costs you money often. Money that you don't have. It can threaten your job. It can ruin relationships. And the list goes on and on and on. So you get the point. And this is just the tip of the iceberg of, of things that we struggle when it comes to self-control. And I haven't touched on most of the ones that are probably your biggest struggle here today because I don't necessarily know what that is. And I'm not trying to purposely step on toes individually, but I want to allow God to move in our spirit in a way that we are convicted. That you want, we want to be more the person God desires us to be. So I want you to think about it. What is it that you struggle with? Where is it that your self-control is lacking? Because self-control, as we read about it in Scripture, is one of the fruits of the Spirit. And we've talked about this, the thing that we've been talking about recently, it's not just something we do for a short period of time. This is about who we're supposed to be. So the people of God are to be people of self-control. And we are to be people of self-control just when it's convenient. We are to be people of self-control just when it's easy. We are to be people of self-control just when people are watching. We're to be people, God's people, of self-control, period. So, how do we get control? I think it begins by being guided by the Spirit. In Galatians, chapter 5, verse 16, we read this. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Self-control is not about trying harder. It's about giving up. It's about giving up what's important to you and giving it to God and allowing Him to have control of your life. I gain control over my sinful desires by giving up control to God and letting His Spirit guide my life. Here's a little illustration that may help us to remember this today. There's a story of a guy that falls off a cliff. Halfway down, he grabs a branch hanging on for dear life. It's 500 feet down that he's fallen. 
It's 500 feet under him. And he cries out, somebody help. And then he hears a voice. And the voice says, this is God. Trust me. Let go and I'll catch you. He looks down. He looks up. He says, is anybody else up there? We aren't willing to let go. We aren't willing to trust. We know we're in a situation that we can't do anything. And we know that God has said he will come. He will help us. He will be there. He has the power. He has the knowledge. He has the love and the crazy love for us. But we still won't let go. And we look for a better way in our minds to get out of it. So why do we have trouble letting go? I think there are five possible reasons. The first is pride. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 12, it says, Before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. All right, I need you to be honest. How many men here have ever gotten lost, but you refuse to ask for directions? We don't have someone lying, because I know there's more than one guy here who has never not asked for directions. And now the wives are pointing. That's another whole sermon. All right, let's move on before everybody gets in trouble. Um, so these are the type of things that keep us from having help. One, we believe we can do it on our own. See, the guys that didn't raise their hand said, I wasn't really lost anyway. I can do it on my own. Or I can figure it out. Or then there's another one. I don't want people to know about my issues. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing when I can't get there without having some help. These are things that our pride can keep us from letting go. You know, maybe you need to get lost, utterly lost, with the fuel light on during a gas shortage before you ask for directions. And if that's the case, God may let you go there. Hear what I'm saying? There's times in our life that... God is there to help us, but we just won't accept his help. And he will let us continue to take ourselves down the road that he doesn't really want us to go. But if that's what it takes for us to finally turn and look up to him, he'll let us do it. But do you really want to wait until then? So, another thing that makes it difficult for us to let go is guilt. Psalm. Chapter 40, verse 12 says this, For trouble without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me, and I cannot see. There are more than the hairs on my head, and my heart fails within me. Have you ever felt like you just messed up so bad? That it's just, it's overwhelming to you that, that, that the sin, that the mistakes, that the screw-ups, the mess-ups, that it's just, you can't get away from it. And so that guilt overtakes you. You know what? This is one of Satan's favorite tools. He uses guilt and shame to convince us that we're not good enough or we're not worthy of God's forgiveness. Because what we've done is so bad or we've done it so often or we've tried so hard and there's just no hope. And that's one of Satan's lies. You know, it is true that we're not good enough or worthy enough. But we don't have to be good enough or worthy enough. Because that's not how we come into relationship with God. We simply give ourselves to God because of his crazy love. And he accepts us as we are and enables us to become who he has designed us to be. So, if you're struggling with this, I want to point this out. If, if, if you're struggling and, and you're struggling with this guilt and you said I've tried, but, and there's people that I've talked to, there, there's people that I've had this conversation with the same person over and over again. I just struggle. I don't feel like I'm good enough. And, and they know that. And they know it's a hardship. Consider this. I believe it's like a sick person saying, I've got to get better before I can go to the hospital. What sense does that make? The hospital is for sick people. Jesus says something very similar to this in Mark chapter 2, verse 17. Uh, verse 17, he says, On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. You know what? If you've got mess ups, he said in the scripture, I'm here for you. That's what I came for. And we need to know that and not buy into Satan's lies. 
Yeah, you're a sinner, and you're not good enough, and God doesn't really want you. That's what he wants to try to make you believe. Another thing that keeps us from letting go is worry. What if I let go? How do I know I'm going to get caught? How do I know it? How do I know what the outcome is going to be? But what about, and you have all these things going through your head. But what about this? What about that? We're never going to have all the answers. We're not up omnipotent. We're not omniscient. We're not omnipresent. But guess who is? God. So we need to trust him. We don't want to let go because we're worried about a million and one different scenarios that might possibly have happened. Matthew 6, 34 says, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You know what? There may be some of us that need that. You've heard it before. I'm going to repeat it again, and if you need it, I want you to write it down. And if there's not a pen or pencil right there in front of the pew, and you've got your phone with you, I'll give you permission. Take your phone out. Start typing it down. That's what you need. This is the scripture. Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. I'll read it one more time, and then I'll give you the reference. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Matthew 6, 34. Now, you might look at me and say, Greg, that sounds all good, but I just don't think it's possible. That's not the way I think. Well, let me clarify a little bit. There's a difference in being concerned and worried. Now, don't, don't over-rationalize this and continue work. Being concerned about something is something that's justifiable, that it makes you upset, and you're, you try to deal with it, and there may be a concern that you have that, that through prayer, through what you're doing, you can, God can use you to make a difference, and that's good. Worry is a waste of time and energy and effort and a distraction from where God wants you to be. That's what worry is. And the Bible says don't do it. And there's times that, just like so many other things, we can't change that in and of ourselves. But if we give it to God, we can. Let go and let Christ today, then tomorrow, with his help, start chipping away at the areas where we need more self-control. Another reason we don't let go is because of fear. Like a man hanging from a branch, God has provided a way out, but we're afraid to let go. We're afraid of losing control. And you know what the funny thing is? We didn't have control to start with. We never did. In fact, you've been controlled your whole life. You've been controlled by your desires and urges. You've been controlled by the opinions of others. You've been controlled by your pride and your ego. You've been controlled by your hurts, your habits, and your hang-ups. You have never been in control. You have always been controlled. Now, you know, I don't really consider him a theologian, but Bob Dylan said something that sounds like pretty good theology to me. He said, you're, go you're going to have to serve somebody. You're going to have to serve somebody. You know what freedom is? Freedom is choosing who controls you. When you give your life up to the care and control of Christ, he sets you free. Now, we can fool ourselves into thinking we've got control of our life, but it's really not us that has control. And I've already explained that. We need to understand that. John chapter 8, verses 34 through 36 helps us to understand the biblical foundation for this truth. Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. So what are you afraid of? What's, what are you holding on to that's keeping you from letting go and allowing you to have the life that God has? Another thing that keeps us from letting go is doubt. You say, my faith is too small. I want to believe, but I can't. Mark chapter 9, verse 24 says, Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, 
I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. He came to Jesus and he said, I do believe, but, but help me over, overcome the, the, the doubts I have. Help me overcome that unbelief, but I do believe. You know what happened in this story? Did, do you remember Jesus saying, you know what, you're right, you do have to believe more. Go back and get straight, then we'll talk about healing your son. Is that what happened? No. The son was healed. This was enough for Jesus to cast the demon out. I do believe. Matthew 17, 20 says, Because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have the faith as small as a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. Move it from here to there, and if you say move it from here to there, it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. It's not the size of your faith that matters. It's the size of your God that matters. A little faith in a big God gets big results. And you know what else happens? Is as that happens, as you allow that faith to be genuine, to, to build relationship with God, that faith has to grow. Think about it. This, this guy that came to Jesus and said, I do believe, help me overcome my belief. Do you think Jesus, what Jesus did, helped him overcome some of his doubt? It did. And the same thing is true with us. The more we allow God to do it in our life, and the more we acknowledge that, and the more we give praise and thanksgiving for that, the more our faith grows. It's not something that we have to sit down and study enough ourselves to make it happen. It's about our relationship with God. So don't let any of the things we just talked about, don't let pride, guilt, worry, fear, or doubt, don't let any of them keep you from letting go of your sin when we really need to be holy moments. So the first step, and I, I'm just going to touch on this really quickly. The first, there's three of them, I think. The first step to getting control is giving up or letting go. And so we have to do that. We can't keep holding on. And, and the first thing I want to suggest is that God's word directs us. The Bible is important. I saw something Yesterday, I think I was driving, I passed by a church, local church, I think, and it said um, an unused Bible is worthless. Hmm. Might look pretty. Might tell people that you think you're a Christian because it's standing on your coffee table. But it's not really going to make a difference in your life if it's unused. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servants of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, a whole sermon, probably a series of sermons, could be preached on that one verse. But I want to pick some out. It says, All Scripture is God-breathed. And then it goes on to sell how, how the Scripture can be used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, that's a lot, and I want you to take note of that. But I really want you to understand that it says the Scripture is God-breathed. This is not a book just like any other book. This is God's holy word, and it is a living word. And what I mean by that, it does something that no other book does. When we come to God's word, I believe very strongly that one of the first things we need to do, and, and a lot of times, myself included, at times I come and I've read the scripture and I just struggle to get anything out of it. I struggle for it to make sense. I struggle to understand it. I struggle to even want to continue reading it at times. But I think some of that is because I'm just doing it because I think somebody's told me I'm supposed to. If we seek God, if we come to the scripture and say, God, I understand this is one of the ways you speak to me and I want to know that, we open our hearts up and we realize that the Holy Spirit speaks through the scripture, it becomes alive and it has meaning. And it's not just stories about something that happened centuries ago, it's about what is happening in our life now and it gives us answers and it gives us direction and it gives us everything this verse just said. And that is not boring. If the Bible is boring, we're doing something wrong. And that's not God's problem, that's ours. But God will, if we will allow him, God will take it. And it will help us 
to embrace the Bible in such a way it becomes the most exciting, life-changing book you could possibly ever read. You know what else I like? And this is, and a lot of times we talk about it being a manual, a manual for how God wants to. I don't think of it as a manual. I don't see it as a manual. It's more than that. I believe this is on-the-job training with God beside us. I do a lot better on the job training than I do read, sitting down and taking a class and reading a bunch of stuff and saying, okay, now you go and do it. You see everything about how you're supposed to do it. Now go do it. I don't think it works that way. I think we're supposed to be in the Word regularly. So as we're going through life, as we're struggling, we open it and we look at it and we read things during the morning and in our morning God takes it and He makes it relevant to what's happening during the day. It's on the job training. It's in the life. It's not simply that we do this so we have this knowledge and then we have to process all that and figure out how it's going to fly over here. And this was something we studied three years ago in the small group that I had, and now it's going to be relevant. It's not that way. Yes, God can use that, but it's so much more than that. We need to recognize the value and embrace it. Another thing that helps us get to where we need to be is that God's people encourage. We'll get a little personal now. Christy, like most people, has struggled just a little bit during the pandemic and gained maybe a few pounds. And so she came to me and she said, Greg, I need your help. I need your help. Please don't bring any life pain in your life. <laughs> that really happened. You laughed. And it's kind of funny when I say it here now, but what do you think I thought and felt when she said that? It was a myriad of emotions. It went from one thing to another. One thing was, you know, they got ice cream on sale on food line right now. You said I it. I can get it. <laughs> and, and then, you know what? I, and she didn't say it. She didn't say anything about you engaged just as much as like what I have. She didn't say that. But that was true too. But what she's coming and saying is, I need your help. I can't do this by myself. We need each other. God's people need each other. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. I don't know if I'm supposed to be privy to this or not, but I want to tell you about something that happened in the women's group. There was someone else just this week that was struggling with something related to diet. It wasn't necessarily overweight, that type of thing. But they were struggling with it. It was hard. And it was challenging. And it was scary to them. And so they put out something to their sister. Women, I need your help. And you know, one of the things I think that this person wanted was follow through prayer. But you know what? These women didn't just write back and say, I prayed it for you. Which they, they do that at times of men's group. We in this church, we pray for each other that night and that couple. But almost immediately, there became support through by saying, here's things that I know have helped other people. Here's something that can happen. And, and this person responded very thankfully. Because it wasn't, whether those things actually become what helps her or not, she feels supported. She knows that people care. And it gives her strength and ability to do stuff that she can't do by herself. And that's how God works in his body, by enabling us to help each other. So, and this is harsh, but you know what? You're not going to overcome the porn habit by isolating yourself in a basement. You're not going to kick your nicotine addiction by hanging around with other smokers all the time. And you're not going to lose weight by watching the cooking channel. We need to support each other. There are times we need to go looking for it. Christy needed to ask me if I could please not bring any more ice cream. And I needed to understand that for what it was. 
not only from her, but from my God. That was a part of me being the husband that God's called me to be. I don't care how much I like our sin. And you know what? It probably helps me a little bit on my own self-control issue. Self-control and love are related. We talked about this crazy love thing and keeps coming up. But self-control is possible because of God's crazy love. We struggle. We look at ourselves and all these things can keep us from letting go of those things that, that we struggle with self-control. But if we accept God's love, then we love in return. We love him. We're able to accept and love ourselves and others as he created us to be. And life becomes more for God. When this happens, when you understand the connection between love and self-control, because love is something we embrace. Love, we understand. The crazy love we're all about. We want to think better of ourselves. We want to love others. But when you understand how this affects your ability to be self-controlled, you will be a better spouse, a better parent, a better friend, a better employee, a better coach if you're coaching, a better whatever you're doing. You'll be more the one God has created you to be. If you let God's spirit guide you, God's word direct you, and God's people encourage you. If we do that, we have freedom in Christ. And freedom in Christ is huge. Huge. It's not just some of the churchy words, and we're talking about it in the evangelism class that um, we're taking now. There's about a dozen people, by the way, if you didn't already know that. If you're interested, you didn't get to be a part of it. Let me know, Laverne, with an E and I. We'll, um, we'll be willing to talk to you about how you can get involved in that if you feel like you, that's something you want to do. But one of the things they talk about is, is that you know, when you're sharing God with others, you can't use all these churchy words. And so freedom in Christ sometimes can sound like a churchy word. What If you've never been to church, you've never said, what does that really mean? Well, you should be able to take any churchy word that you've got and really break it down and say it so that anybody who's never heard anything about God or church can understand. So will you tell me what's freedom in Christ? Freedom in Christ means being able to give up control in such a way that you're able to live your life without the trappings of this world, without the guilt, without the issues that are affected by pride to keep you from, from being open about who you are. And the list just continues going on and on. Let me give you an illustration. Since we're talking about temptation, anybody here like cookies? <laughs> Raise your hand if you like cookies. All right. Um, half of you are honest. But, um, so if you, um, it, it's a story about this, this kid that puts his hand in the cookie jar. And he grabs that cookie. And he goes to take it out. And he can't get it out because he's got this fish and it won't come out. So he calls his dad and says, Dad, I'm stuck. I can't get it out. So his dad comes and puts Crisco on his arm. Still can't get it out. And it's just, it's, he's struggling and struggling. He's saying, my arm is going to have to go around with this on my hand. And the dad said, you know what? Maybe you can just let go. He said, I can't let go. I'll drop my cookie. I can't let go. This is my cookie. I deserve it. It's mine. I want it. If I let go, I won't have it anymore. Not to mention that this father knows Although the child doesn't, if he lets go, he would still be able to get that exact cookie out and so much more. But there's so much more that that father can give other than just cookies. But that's all this child can see. And sometimes that's the way we respond as a child of God. We've got our hands in the cookie jar, and he's just saying, let go. And he can't. And our praise team come forward, please. They do. I want to ask you, what is it that you're struggling with? What is it that you have given more control to than you have given to God? What aspect of that life is, of your life, is it for some reason that when you look at it, it, it defines at least a part of who you are in a way you don't like. And you know God doesn't like it either. And you know what? A lot of times in sermons like this, Satan 
will get in and miss. And, and I, I want to believe that I believe that this is a trade. I don't believe Satan has any power in this place and I miss right now because I don't believe to allow it. But as we leave this place, there can be people who, because of whatever you're going through, he can take it back and say, you know, the preacher knows you're doing that stuff. And then just that guilt begins to pile on top of you again. And then you just feel like more worthless because you can't. And that's the exact opposite. What God wants you to understand is you can have freedom from that. If you're just willing to give to God whatever our struggles are. And I know it's not easy. We need the word. We need the support from each other. We need to seek him. Will you do that today? I believe every person in here, myself included, has something that's keeping us from being 100% who God wants us to be today. Will we take a step in moving closer to where he wants us to be? I'll be up here and be willing to pray. The altar is open. We're going to have small groups following this, and our small groups might get kind of weird today. You don't have to share anything you don't want to, and our small group leaders know that. We don't push you in that. But there's an opportunity for, for us to support each other, and that's what happens. That's one of the things the Bible tells us to do. Respond as God would lead, as we seek to be people of self-control. Let's stand together and sing this.
must have tried to do it before. But we have to surrender. The problem is we try it on our own and we try it so hard. some of those steps we talked about today by getting into his word, by staying connected to God on a daily basis, by seeking out others in Christ who you know you can trust are going to have your back. <coughs> Will you do that? Lord, we feel strength in this place. We're reminded of your word. We know how much you love us. And we know that love is unconditional, but Lord, as we go out, we, we're put back into the world where we face those temptations and we're faced with other people's eyes and, and we have decisions to make. And Lord, some of us need to make decisions or take steps in directions we've never taken before. And God, even though we know it's where we're supposed to go, it's scary, God. It really is. I just ask that you would give us the ability to take one step this week. One step in the direction you would have us to go. And Lord, as we do that, I pray that we would also be willing to walk alongside another brother or sister in Christ who is seeking to take a step as well. And as we do that, we don't get to where we rely so much on each other, but we constantly open your word and ask you to be a part of us understanding it so that it becomes on-the-job training to understand how your word every day is real in our life. God, you have a beautiful plan and purpose, and, and I know you desire all of us to spend eternity in heaven, but the joy, God, doesn't start there. It starts now when we open our lives to you. So, God, I ask right now that all of us just seek to do that, to surrender fully to you and embrace what you have to give us, that we can be the people you have called us.